Father, I just pray right now for each person in this room, Lord, would you open our eyes to see some things we haven't seen before? Would you open our ears to hear something we haven't heard before? God, would you continue to take us on that journey of discipleship, Lord? Continue to conform us into the image of your Son. That's our prayer this morning, Father, as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 2. Who has a collection of ancient documents on them right now? Anybody? Handful of you. We see Sarah Gray here. No, oh, you've got one. Good on you. If you've got one, why don't you hold it up? If you've got a collection of ancient documents, why don't you hold it up for everyone to see? Just for those of you that don't know what they are, that's what they look like. You want to remember Bibles? Remember we used to have books? And now it's all on the phone. And uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of people sit there and go, no, I'm reading my Bible on my phone. I remember when we first started live streaming and uh, there was a person sitting over there and, and they got their phone out and said, no, no, I'm on my Bible. And I went back and had a look at it and they were on Facebook. <laughs> so if you're in this middle section, you better be on your Bibles, all right? You'll be, people at home will see. People at home will see. We've been talking about redigging wells and the, the concept of uh, uh, going back and, and re- redigging wells in the Old Testament. We started with the story uh, where Abraham's wells were uh, filled in and uh, they were filled in uh, by the enemy to stop the next generation basically from accessing what was in those wells. It wasn't that what was in the wells was no good that there was no life or anything in there. But it was a strategy to stop the next generation from actually accessing the goodness and the life and the resource and all the things that were able to come out of those wells. And so we've been sort of taking that concept and idea and going, well, what is it that the early church had? What were some of the places that the early church drank from? What were some of the wells they got life and sustenance from? That maybe now we've moved a little bit away from some of that stuff. How many of you know that we're much more sophisticated now as a church? We're much more sophisticated. We've got smoke machines and bells and whistles and lights, all these things. Who needs, who needs these ancient things such as prayer and the word of God anymore? We've got, you know, all this other stuff. Uh, and, and if we're brutally honest, we read the book of Acts and we look at some of the things that God did in that space. And deep in our hearts, we yearn for that, don't we? We, we yearn for that kind of relationship with God. We, we yearn to be a part of a community like that. That, that, that is bound together, that is seeing God move. We, we, I, I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of a story where 3,000 are added to the number that day and then 2,000 here and so on. I want the story of the church, and I'm not just talking about a rise, I'm talking about uh, the church in Lismore, I'm talking about the church nationally, globally, and, and it is happening in places, but right now here in Lismore, I would love a book to be being written and daily the Lord added to their numbers. Wouldn't that be awesome to be in our community and daily God was adding to their numbers and the Spirit of God was moving. And there were people being healed and set free of demonic oppression and chains breaking off them. And people were coming to faith. People were realizing deep down, I've tried everything else and it hasn't answered the deep burning questions of life. I haven't found the fulfillment I've been searching for. So maybe I'm going to rock up to a gathering one Sunday, go into one of these buildings and I'm going to just see what that's all about. I want to see what this Jesus story is all about. Who would love to be a part of, of that? That's, that's in my heart. I, I, I feel this deep-seated desire to want to go back and go, okay, God, we've maybe gone a couple of degrees here and there off kilter, and over a long journey, one degree can land you in a really, really far away place from where you started. And so, God, how do we get back to uh, being uh, the people of God? Because I remember praying a long time ago, a long time ago, and saying, Lord, I want you to be, to me, the same God you were to the church in the book of Acts. And the Holy Spirit very gently spoke back to me and said, Alan, I can be the same God to you that I was to the church in the book of Acts, but you've got to be the church to me that I had back in the book of Acts. And I never prayed that again because I thought, oops, <laughs> it's gotten a bit fine to the bone, God. Why don't you just do what I want because I want when I want? It doesn't quite work that way. So we've been looking at going back and re-digging wheels. And I want to move on to the fifth well this morning. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. It says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 souls in a day. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Wouldn't that be awesome? This is the first uh, message that Peter gets up at the birthing of this movement that we call the church. He gets up and he preaches. And it's not a feel-good message too, by the way. Go back and read it. He gets up here and he just says, you know this Jesus who you crucified? He wasn't afraid to be honest. This is the gospel message. You guys did this to him. And that's who we're preaching to you now. He's raised from the dead and so on. I can't imagine, it wasn't a really great self-motivation talk. I'm going to make you feel good about yourself so that you'll come to Jesus. So no, 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 you guys killed him, okay? But, hey, it was all part of the plan of God. And what's happening right now is the birthing of this movement. He needed to die in order for his spirit to come, in order for this movement to be birthed and so on. And so it's not a feel-good message, but 3,000 people are added, it says, 
that day. And then it's almost like we get this picture here that I think sort of carries a bit of a foundation that then we see right through the first 30 years of church history in the, in the, in the writings of Luke in the book of Acts. And I think this is a real foundational stone upon the rest of the story. It says that they heard the gospel and they responded. They gave their lives to Christ. They devoted themselves to Christ. And then the consequence of that we read in verse 46 to 47. It says, and then, they can, verse 42, sorry, then they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Verse 42, my mistake. It says they continued steadfastly. In other words, what it means, the NIV says they devoted themselves, which is a much better translation of the actual Greek phrase. They devoted themselves. So 3,000 people came to faith and they gave their life to Jesus Christ. And as a result of devoting themselves first to Jesus, they then went on and practically devoted themselves to these things. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to the word of God. They were devoted to the word of God. How many of you know nobody else can devote you to anything? I can't devote you to the word of God. If you're a young person in this room, your parents can't devote you to the word of God. You have to make that decision, that conscious choice to devote yourself to the word of God. These people made an individual choice first to devote themselves to Jesus. And as a result of devoting themselves to Jesus, then it says that they practically devoted themselves to the word of God. It goes on, it says they then devoted themselves to fellowship. And I want to come back to that. It says they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread to communion, to to keeping the the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus as a central theme of everything. Amen? The the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I I, I don't follow Jesus because he answered a prayer of mine once. Let me rephrase it. I don't follow Jesus because he answered a prayer of mine once the way I wanted him to answer it. I believe God answers prayer all the time. But I also believe in a father who knows way better than I do, sees a bigger picture than I do, and has my best interests at heart, in, in the bigger scheme of things, not just my selfish little interest in the moment. Amen? Yeah. So I pray and I trust that God hears my prayers and I believe in a God that answers my prayers and sometimes he doesn't answer it the way I want. Remember Paul prayed, take this, this, this thorn away from me and God said, my grace is sufficient. Paul wanted it taken away. God said, well, no, there's another plan here. But he answered prayer. So I believe in a God that answers prayer, but I don't follow Jesus because he answered a prayer. I don't follow Jesus because once I was sick and he physically healed me. I've had a few miracles of healing. But I don't follow Jesus because of that because there have been other things that I've prayed for when I've been sick and I haven't been healed the way I wanted. There have been other prayers I've prayed where I haven't been answered the way I wanted. So I don't follow Jesus because of an answered prayer. I don't follow Jesus because of a healing. I don't follow Jesus because I saw a miracle. I follow Jesus because 2,000 years ago in human history, something happened. Something happened. There's a historical reality and basis to my faith. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, came into the world, was crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead. Resurrected from the dead. So my faith is based in that, what they call the breaking of bread, which is remembering communion, remembering and celebrating the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And as a church, we need to keep that central to the teaching of the church. But each of us as individuals, you need to keep that central to your life as well. It's because of Jesus. It's because of what Jesus did. It's not because I'm great. Not because I've reached some place of spiritual maturity or I'm more holy. I'm, no, it's always going to be grace. It's always going to be the grace of God. I was saved by the grace of God. I'll be carried by the grace of God and I'll make it through to the end by the grace of God. And then it says prayers. And that word in the Greek is plural. So, so there, there would have been prayers together in the context of a gathering, but also individual prayers as well. So, so it says that they devoted themselves to Jesus, and then as a result of their devotion to Jesus, these things naturally occurred. It doesn't say anywhere there, they were sat down and told, now that you're a Christian, here's what you have to do. Now, there was a cultural thing going on in the background where they already had some of this stuff in place, but it changed meaning and it changed shape a little bit. But the point is they devoted themselves to this stuff. And I guess the question is, have we devoted ourselves to this stuff? Do you come on a Sunday hoping that somebody will devote you to some of these things? Maybe there'll be a preacher there who'll motivate you enough just to crawl through the next six days and read your Bible. Maybe you make it four, and then three, uh, not that, in, and then I'll come back and give me another injection. And let's, or have you made the decision to devote yourself to these things? Because it appears to me that right at the very beginning of the church, those that devoted themselves to Jesus, the next step was then they practically devoted themselves to these basic things. That, by the way, you, you have seen in the church for the last 2,000 years, these things have basically been the core of when churches gather together. It doesn't matter where you go, they're there. 
So verse 41 is the cause, verse 42 is the effect. And that leads me to what I want to talk about today, the fifth well. And the well I want to talk about today is this, it's the well of Christian fellowship. The well of Christian fellowship. It's interesting that in the list of things that they devoted themselves to, we talk about devoting ourselves to the word of God and we go, yeah, yeah, picking up a Bible and reading it, like devoting ourselves to prayer, yeah. But these guys devoted themselves to fellowship. Think about that. They devoted themselves to this thing called Christian fellowship. My question to you, are you committed as the early church were to this thing that we call Christian fellowship? Are you devoted to it? Not just, do I want it? Do I pop in it? No, are you devoted? Have you in your heart devoted yourself to this thing that we call fellowship? The Greek word, there's the word koinonia. We would all, all would have heard it because there's a camp at Evans Head called koinonia. And it means more than just getting together. It meant more than just being in a crowd of religiously like-minded people. It's a part of it, but it meant more than that. And it wasn't just about participating together in certain activities, although that is definitely a part of it. The word koinonia means fellowship, association, community, and joint participation. To get a better understanding of what koinonia is, I think we go back to John chapter 3. Everyone remembers that conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. So we've talked about that, John 3.16 this morning, you know. God so loved the world. If we go back to the beginning of that conversation, John chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again. Born again. Everyone say born again. again. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, when we read this phrase, born again, We have a picture of what born again means, right? For most of us, born again means I didn't have a relationship with God. Now I have a relationship with God, so I'm born again. Because I've been reconnected with God. I've been disconnected from him, and now I've reconnected. So I've I've been born again. It's me and God, and I'm born again. That's kind of the picture that many of us have when we hear the word born again. But Nicodemus would have had a different picture, and Jesus would have had a different picture when he used the phrase born again. Nicodemus focuses on, uh, he says, how can I be born again when I'm old? And then the second part, he says, do I need to crawl back up into my mother's womb? Now, most of the time, again, when we hear this, read this, we focus on the second bit. How can you crawl back into the womb? But I think there's something really important in the first part. How can a man be born when he's old? You see, the Jews had a concept of born again. The phrase born again actually meant something to them. And in the life of a Jewish person, I think from what I've studied and read, there's about eight different stages in a Jewish boy's life where he could become born again. Now, not every Jewish boy had to go through all eight stages. But there are different stages of life where you are considered to be born again. Uh, They're bar mitzvah at 13 years of age. They were referred to as you have been reborn, you've been born again. You're 13, now you start taking responsibility for your own sin. You start taking a bit more responsibility. And they were considered, they would say that this child has been born again. When you got married, which was usually between the age of 16 to 20 for a Jewish man, you were considered born again. Why? Because it's a totally new life, new stage of life. Now you have this uh, wife to take care of and family. So they would use the phrase that you had been reborn or born again. When you were ordained as a rabbi... Which we, know, uh, which we know that um, he was, which happened at around 30 years of age, they would say the same phrase. They would say that this is another stage of being reborn or born again. So you see that Nicodemus has got this idea. When Jesus says born again, it's not this blank canvas and he goes, please explain. He's got a picture. Okay, I know what that means. I know what that means. And when he became the head of a rabbinic seminary, which we know historically that Nicodemus was, at around 50 Again, they, you were said to be reborn, born again. So this phrase had meaning to him. There were other things that meant born again, uh, uh, baptism and, and uh, repentance. There were a few other things along the way there that had this illusion of, okay, going through this, now you've been born again and so on. So that was the Jewish idea of born again. And then Nicodemus had actually, when Jesus says you've got to be born again, Nicodemus is sitting back there going, every stage of born again that I could possibly have, I've entered into it already by this stage of my life. So this is what he means. He goes, how can a man be born when he's old? I've, every one of those stages, I've gone past those stages. How can I go back and be born again? The only option is, are you saying I've got to crawl back inside my mother's womb and be born? Like, but it's not just a throwaway statement. He's a smart man. And he realizes that there's a concept of being born again. There was also a Gentile concept of being born again. When a Gentile would come into the Jewish family, would come across to the Jewish faith. 
And rabbis spoke of Gentile converts to Judaism as becoming like newborn children or being born again. As the waters of baptism cleansed them from all past impurity, they were now clean before God, but there was more to it. They weren't just clean before God, they were also placed into the Jewish community. They were placed into a family. They were placed into a family. A a new set of values. With that placing in the family came a new identity, a new set of responsibilities, a new set of rights, and so on and so forth when they came into that community. The born-again experience was so complete that it annulled all former relationships as they were seen as reborn. There was a, a, a quip I came across that some rabbis used to say, and that was that if a, if a Gentile converted to Judaism, they were so born again and they were such a new person that that guy could then turn around and marry his own mother. That's how seriously they took the breaking of all those past relationships. Now, that's not to be disrespectful to our mother. I'm not saying disregard your birth. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we don't... It's not that that's a big problem for us, is the disassociation from our old relationships and that. We keep them, we maintain them very, very well. We still walk in a lot of those. It's not about that. It's about the understanding that have we immersed ourselves into the new community. The way that Jesus envisioned when he talked about being born again. The way Nicodemus understood the term born again. It wasn't just about my relationship with God. It was about my relationship with the church. It was about my relationship with the rest of that community. So when we think born again today, we think of simply coming to God. But Nicodemus and Jesus understood it to mean coming to God and coming into a community. Coming into a new community. That's the picture of born again. You are literally now interconnected to a new family of people, the church. We now become interdependent on one another. That means we need one another, whether we like it or not. You need me, whether you like it or not. <laughs> hey? And I need you. The, the, the imagery that Paul writes and so on about us being a body. We're so connected that we give and take life from each other. That we, we, we feed into each other. That's the picture of community. As Jesus envisioned it when Jesus created the church. And my question again, have you devoted yourself to fellowship? As the New Testament talks and models fellowship. So you cannot separate your relationship to God with your relationship to his people. We can't can't do it. And to think that we can would be to go outside of the bounds of what I believe the New Testament teaches. Now in the West here, we kind of feel like we can have our lone ranger relationship with God. Ever heard people say, I love God, but I don't like the church. Ever heard that? Please don't ever say that to somebody. Please don't say that. I love God, but I don't like the church. You know, that would be considered so incongruent in most cultures on planet Earth today. Most Christians on planet Earth today would never agree with that statement, would not live that out. Go go, go to a a culture outside of the West and examine how how they understand the concept of fellowship, how they understand the dependence on one another, how they immerse themselves into the community of the church, how they immerse themselves into the body of Christ. It's such a Western mentality to feel like I can be a believer and have my own private relationship with God, but I don't need the church. You just end up weird. Sorry, but you do. You end up weird. We've got testimony. We've shared it here before. Really good friend of ours worked with us in a youth group. Long story short, there's my phrase, long story short, Ended up in a straitjacket and in a lunatic asylum. Full on, love the Lord. When did it start? He decided one day that he would just watch television evangelists and he didn't need to go to church and be a part of fellowship anymore. And he isolated himself. And that's where it got him. And I've seen too many people go loopy and weird because they don't understand that it's not just about my relationship with God, it's also my relationship with his body. It's an important, important part of it. You can't separate them. You cannot separate them. Paul uh, describes it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Paul says this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. You're a new creation. And then he says this. Old things have passed away. Now, when we think of that, we just think of old things have passed away as in my sin, my shame, my guilt, all that's gone. Old things have passed away. But it means so much more than that. It means your old identity has passed away. You have a new identity. With that new identity is a new bunch of of, of rights and privileges and a new set of responsibilities. And some of those responsibilities are to one another and are to God. And that's part of God's grand design for the church. So the New Testament church is a church that participated together in life, faith, and mission. We'll never experience fellowship 
We will never understand fellowship and we'll never reap the benefits of fellowship like the early church until we devote ourselves to fellowship like the early church. We just won't. We'll continue to be somewhat of a fragmented mess. And that was never the design of God, never the purpose of God. Never the purpose of God. Corey Tenboom once said this. She said, when a Christian shuns fellowship with other Christians, the devil smiles. The devil smiles when we isolate ourselves. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He said, Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It's his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. He attaches far more importance to godly intercourse than we do. Since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. And how often do we bow to that? How often do believers cause the devil to smile, according to Corey Ten Boom? How often do we bow and separate and allow ourselves to be divided? Billy Graham put it very succinctly. He said, Christian fellowship is not optional. It's essential. It's essential. The early church knew this. That's why they devoted themselves. In other words, they didn't just pop out of it once they felt bored. They didn't pop out of it when they thought they'd had enough. When they felt like they'd outgrown it. I've heard people say, I've outgrown the church. How do you outgrow the body of Christ? I don't don't know. Unless you're Shrek and you're the head and it's oversized, maybe. How do you do that? Or they felt like they were too mature for the church. Now these guys continued steadfast. They devoted themselves to fellowship. It was a conscious decision to be devoted to fellowship. Because let's face it, sometimes it's just easier not to. Isn't it? Let's be honest. Sometimes it's just easy not to be devoted to this thing. I'm going to the gym at the moment. Any of you notice the transformation of my body over the 12 months? Just nod and say yes. Make me feel good. Encourage me. Amazing. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. It's amazing. My wife does. She's like, oh, you're buff, man. You're getting buff. I'm saying that by faith in the hope that she will say that to me eventually. But I'm going to the gym, and here's the thing. Everyone that that goes to the gym and runs, like Luke, you would probably attest to this, there's a point where you actually, your body actually wants it, right? There's a point where, to start with, nobody, you don't want this thing. I don't want, I've got to be honest, I don't like exercise. I want to win the gold medal but I don't want to exercise to get there. I just want the medal. Just, I just want to be the best, but I don't want to have to practice and train. Right? But I'm going to the gym, and I'm, I'm hanging on to that, Luke. I'm hanging on to the fact that at some point, my body's going to go, you have to go. I just want to go. And I'm going to go, yes, I feel like this. And I'm just doing all this stuff because I feel like it. But right now, I am running on pure devotion. I don't like it. I don't want to go. Every day I can think of a, a thousand excuses why I don't want to go to the gym. Oh, I can't go to the gym because the, you know, the wind's blowing westerly and you know, I, 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 the car might, I, I can think of a thousand excuses why I can't go. But right now I'm purely running on devotion. I'm not running on anything else. Whether I get there or not, I'm going to keep at it though because I know it's good for me. I know it's good for me. And this is the thing with fellowship. It's good for you. It's good for you. It's not good for man to be alone. Who said that? It wasn't me. It was him. It's not good for you to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. But he wasn't alone. It was Adam and God. That's not alone. That's awesome. Isn't that the perfect world? He said, no, it's not. You need other people. You need other people. We need each other. So I know it's not good for man to be alone. And I need this thing called New Testament uh, fellowship. Why? I'm going to give you three real simple reasons why. Real simple. Number one, Christians who devote themselves to fellowship grow together they grow together proverbs 27 17 as iron sharpens iron so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend you know you're being sharpened every day by the people you spend your time with who knows that you're being some of them you know it don't you they're sharpening you you're being sharpened by the people that you spend time with and the people that you hang around i i can't think of a better group of people to sharpen me than a group of people that love jesus I can't think of a better group of people to sharpen me than a group of people that, that, that actually get into this collection of ancient documents we call a Bible and, 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 and love Jesus and, and, and pray for me and, and believe the best in me and want to spur me on towards Jesus, not away from Jesus. They want to pull me out so that I can be a blessing, not cause me to go. I, I can't think of a better group of people to do life with and to sharpen me than the people of God. Amen? I can't think of a better, better group. So what's the process God uses to grow you? Well, people are pretty much part of the process, aren't they? You don't grow in isolation, it's people. We rub, we we, we sharpen, we cut the edges off. Sometimes we give edges too. Sometimes we might even scar the side of the sword. But we need each other. We are part of the process of growth. And someone's going to sharpen you, so it might as well be a follower of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, Paul writes this. 
It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering. What's that saying, bold? Bearing with who? Bearing with one another in love. There are going to be moments where you are just going to have to suck it up and bear with me in love. I'm sorry, but it's just the way it is. And there are moments where I'm going to have to just suck it up and bear with you in love. Amen? It's not all daffodils and sunshine. We are human beings. We are people. We have had hurts and we have had disappointments and we've got rough edges and we've got all that sort of stuff. And that's part of, of, of what, what, what the, be- the beauty of the church is not that the people are perfect. It's that a perfect God accepts this dysfunctional group of people and pulls us all together under the one banner. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and we find unity, not in the fact that we all think the same, we all talk the same, we believe the same about everything. We find unity because we're all looking at the same thing. We're all looking at Jesus. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus. And it says there that we're going to bear with one another in love. He's talking to the church. So if you've ever been to a church and you suddenly realize, hang on a second, that place ain't perfect. There are some people there I don't really get on with. There are some people there that I don't like the way they don't like the way. Hey, it's not new. It's been going on since the very birth of the church. But God's people who are devoted to fellowship, they bear with one another in love. They bear with one another in love. See, the problem with many believers is that instead of seeing the resistance as an opportunity to grow, they use it as an excuse to go. I'm just going to leave because I don't get on with you and I don't like you and so on. And I'm not saying there are not moments where you may need to leave and go and find another community of faith to do life with. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if you're going to have, be the kind of person that doesn't like iron sharpening iron, if you're going to be the kind of person that doesn't choose to bear with others in love, you're going to be hopping around like an Easter bunny from place to place to place. The second thing, Christians who are devoted to fellowship, they sow together. They sow together. None of us have all the gifts. None of us have all the finance. None of us have all the time. None of us have all the energy. So we work together for the glory of God and the extension of his kingdom. Who believes that the kingdom of God is a good place? Who believes that, that God's, if God's church grows and thrives, that the community in which God's people are thrives as well? Who believes that? I, I, I heard a guy say years and years ago that the church is kind of like the... What was the term he used? He said the church is is the hope of the world because Christ is in the church and, and, and so on. Now, I know what he meant. Jesus is the hope of the world. But God chooses to use fallible people like you and me to extend his kingdom down here on earth. He chooses to invite us to step into a place where we participate with him in the extension of his kingdom. And I can think of nothing more eternally important or valuable than to spend a bit of my time and a bit of my energy and a bit of my finance and my resource in the process of working with a bunch of other people and extending the kingdom of God. Because I can't do it by myself and neither can you. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 and 16, but speaking the truth in love, he's speaking about the body, about the church. He says, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into all things into him who is the head which is Christ. Think about this. A funny thought hit me the other day when I was reading this. If Christ is the head and we are the body, if I choose to cut my finger off and throw it over there, is it still a part of the body? So many Christians are like that. We don't want to be part of the body. We want to be more like a prosthetic limb. I'll just pop on when I feel like being there and I look like it, but I'm not giving you anything and I'm not getting anything from you. I'm just there. No, I don't feel like it. I'll just pop myself off and go over here and the body runs around with a missing arm because you're not there. We're not prosthetic limbs. We're part of a body. Again, whether we like it or not. My suggestion is we get like the early church and we devote ourselves to it and we commit ourselves to it so that the devil can't easily run around and isolate. I watched an African documentary once with the, you know, the animals in Africa, and, and, and it showed the pack of lions and the zebra, and the zebra were running, trying to get away, and the lions were running sort of beside them. And I'm thinking, why aren't you just jumping on all these zebras and ripping them apart? They don't. They ran, they herd them this way, that way, that way. Then eventually, all the herd runs that way. One zebra isolated himself and ran in the wrong direction by himself. All them lions left, that zebra, bang, they all took off, and they grabbed the one who isolated himself. I think the devil looks, works like that. He's a roaring lion looking for people to devour. And the easiest way to devour somebody is if I can separate them from the rest of the herd. There's a picture in that. Speaking the truth in love that we would grow up into all things into him, the head Christ. 
from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what? A couple of joints supply, is that what it says? Oh, no, hang on, it says every, does it? Yeah, it says every joint supplies. So every joint supplies something. Every joint does something. According to the effective working by which some parts, no, it says every part does its share. Every part does its share. Imagine being in a fellowship where every part does its share. Every part does its share. Every part realizes I've got some energy I can give, some time I can give, some resource, some finance I can give, some prayers I can give. Imagine that. This is the picture that Paul has of a body. Every part has something to contribute. Every part has something to supply. It's about participating in a mission, not simply attending a meeting. That's how we sew together. That's how we sew together. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God. But if we don't have waterers and we don't have planters, then does God have anything to increase? So we all play a role. We all play a part. One of the ways the devil stops us sewing together is by duping us into thinking that participation is actually about self-fulfillment when it's actually about service. No? It's all about self-fulfillment. I can't tell you the amount of stories I've heard of people that have come into fellowships over my time as a pastor and talking to other pastors. Come on in and go, oh, I want to preach. Well, look, the preaching roster is full at the moment. Don't have any needs there, but you know, we really do need somebody to, to maybe go on a cleaning roster or we need somebody that'll, that'll help with the global care, the, the, you know, getting together with mowing lawns on weekends, something like that. And I'll turn around and go, no, it's not my gift, no. It's all about self-fulfillment. One of the greatest men of God I've ever met in my life is an Indian man named Samji. And I was so blessed to become a really good friend of his over time when we lived there and going in and out. And I've never met a human being like him, in terms of his relationship with God. I would, I would put him in the Hebrews list of heroes of the faith. He was a great man. And I remember him sharing with me the story of how he started out. This is a guy that at the end of his life could walk into rooms. I saw him walk into rooms. And, 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 and you know, literally, you, you, demons would tremble. People would just start manifesting and trying to run out of the room. And he hadn't done anything. He just walked in, you know? Uh, healing, people, people that hadn't walked, people that had goiters were falling off, cancers were being healed, all kinds of... Yet you would never, ever know that about him if he walked in here. Such a non-assuming, down-to-earth, humble Indian man. And he told me the story that he was in, in the Indian army and he got saved. He was standing on the edge of a bridge one night about to jump off the bridge. He wanted to end his life. And he's standing on the bridge about to jump and he said, a Christian man walked past and started talking to me about Jesus. Don't do this. You, you need you. He was a Hindu at the time. You need Jesus. Started talking to him about Jesus. Eventually got him down, shared the gospel with him. Samji got radically saved that night, gave his life to Jesus. Had such a passion and such a love for Jesus. He just wanted to do something for God. And what was placed in his heart was he wanted to go to North India to the hill tribes and he wanted to uh, go and preach in the untouchables, all those sort of people up in there where nobody would go and so on. He wanted to go there. And eventually when he got the chance, he would walk for four or five days from one, to get to one village. Then he would preach the gospel to them, pray with them and so on. Then he'd walk for three days through the jungles to find another village because he'd see a pillar of smoke somewhere over there. And started this great ministry, uh, ended up with about 110 different missionaries working out of his organization and so on. But he said when he started, here's what happened. I went to, I did my training and then there was a Bible college at the foot of the mountain. So I went to that Bible college and I said, would you send me out? I want to be a missionary. Would you guys uh, ordain me and send me out to go? And they actually said, look, we don't need anyone to go to those tribes right now. The time's not right now. What we do need is we need someone to clean the toilets. Has anyone ever cleaned an Indian toilet? Okay? It's not like you got here with a flush matic and a big brush. And so Samji, for a couple of years, a couple of years, would get a toothbrush and he would scrub the tiles. And he would scrub the toilets. He said, I was going to make sure that those toilets, you know, it says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all unto the Lord. He said, I scrub those toilets for Jesus. Here he is, a man with a heart that's going to go on and going to be, in my opinion, one of the most amazing men of God I ever met. But he said, that's what they wanted. So he said, I did it. He said, I'd be on my hands and knees scrubbing. At the end of the, end of the, the days, as summer's going down, I'd see the smoke coming up from the hill tribes. He said, I would pray for them. Jesus, send someone. It can't be me right now. Send someone to these people. So we've been duped into thinking that service means self-fulfillment. If it's not fulfilling, I don't want to do it. Well, let me tell you something about the church. The church will never grow if a bunch of believers sit there going, unless it's self-fulfilling, I'm not going to do anything. 
It's not about self-fulfillment. It's about service to God and service to the kingdom. And I believe that we, we get to land in those places. You know, I remember, uh, we, we, I didn't introduce them. This is Mark and Sue Wong. Um, these guys have known me and Jackie since we were about six months old in the Lord. Way back. As a matter of fact, when we first went to YWAM and we did our discipleship training school, these guys were our school leaders. So we owe a lot to the grace that these guys gave to us. I know I did. I thank you for the wake-up roster on my DTS. Staff and waking me up, and I could have been told, no, you need to go. But I remember when I finished my DTS. Not that I had any grand aspirations of doing anything, but, you know, the staff go around and they were grabbing people for different things. Nobody wanted me to be a DTS staff member. Someone asked me to come and be maintenance, mow the lawn. Was that your fault? No one saw the greatness that was in me. They just, but you know what? I did it. I loved it. Schools would come on in and, and somebody wanted a screen door fixed, I'd fix it. They wanted a shelf put up, I'd put a shelf up. I'd mow lawns, I'd do, do the bread run every afternoon, jump in the car and go and pick up the bread. Mind you, I ate all the cream buns on the way home. So the rest of the never got cream buns, I ate them all. There was a little bit of incentive there. But the point is this, you just, you just, you just serve where there's need. That's what the church was built on. Serve where there's need. Eventually, yeah, I'm sure we all land in those places where we find more in it. But, but, but we just got to start. We just got to get up and go, I'm going to serve. Where's the need? I'm just going to serve. So we sow together. And the third thing, Christians who are devoted to fellowship, they glow together. I love this one. They glow together. It just sounds cool. I tried to think of three things that ended with O, and glow was the one that I landed on. John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you that you, what? Love one another. That was said with great passion, wasn't it? That you love one another. Love one, which means bearing with one another in love and all that sort of stuff. It means putting up with you, means being rubbed on by others. But he said this, I give you this commandment that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. That's interesting too, is he's loved us. Do you think that the disciples were perfect the whole time? Do you think that Jesus didn't have to bear with one another of them in love at any point? No? Knuckleheads? He had to bear with them in love and he's saying the same way I bared with them in love and the same way I bear with you. You're not to learn to bear with one another. He says, I want you to love one another. And then it says in verse 35, by this, by this, we all know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, your love for one another. I think somewhere, somewhere, and hear my heart in this, somewhere we've gone to a bit of an extreme where we're so social justice oriented and so social work oriented that it's more important that we go out there. Everyone says, we need the church to be seen out there doing all this great stuff. Well, here's the thing. The world is happy to take the fruit of your faith in Jesus. They don't want the message of Jesus, though. But they're happy to take the fruit. Go and be as good as you want. That's great. I wonder whether when the church started, whether Jesus envisioned a community of faith that so loved one another, that was so compelling, that those outside that community would look in and go, look at that. There's something about that community, not just individual. There's something about that community, their commitment to one another, their commitment to be together, their commitment to serve one another. There's something so compelling about that community. I want to know how to get into that community. I wonder whether we've lost a little bit of that. With our heart, our heart's good. Let's get out there and do all these things. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that stuff. We should. We should. But Jesus seemed to say, you know what? If you loved each other the same way you're trying to love everyone out there, maybe that would be a better witness to the world. Maybe that would be a better witness to the world. We think loving the world is what will get them to see Jesus. And Jesus said, try loving each other first. That will get their attention. So finishing up, people are going to give lots of reasons why they don't want to devote themselves to fellowship today. And I just want to quickly fire a couple of quick ones at you. I've been hurt by the church. Who's ever been hurt by the church? Yep. Okay, who's ever been hurt by a school teacher? Who's ever been hurt by a politician? Who's ever been hurt by a friend? Who's ever been, I could keep going on all day, couldn't I? Hey? For some reason, we're allowed to be hurt by every other realm of society, but we keep going back. The grocer hurt me, but I'm going back to buy it there. Harvey Norman guy, he didn't treat me really well, but it's the cheapest, so I'm going back there to buy it again. We can put up with hurt from everybody without making up the dumb excuse I've been hurt by them, but the church, one person, ooh, I'm out. Well, you're not very devoted. The problem is not the person that hurts you. It's your own level of devotion to fellowship. If you can that easily be severed from the body of Christ, then I would go back first and go, what's my devotion to Jesus like first? Because all this other stuff seemed to be a fruit of a group of people that were first devoted to him. So I'd say go back, stop looking at them, look at your relationship with Jesus. Where's that at? Go back to that place. 
See, the bottom line is this. You haven't been hurt by the church. You've been hurt by an individual in the church. There's, 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 there's a hundred odd people that call a rise home. Have a hundred odd people hurt you in this place? Maybe one or two have or three. I can live with that and hopefully you can live with that too. Probably that happens because we're human, we're imperfect. But when you say, I've been hurt by the church, the church is billions of individuals loving Jesus. Have they all hurt you? Of course they haven't. Of course they haven't. So we've got to be careful when we say things like, I've been hurt by the church. Bottom line, who hasn't been hurt by the church? And if you haven't been hurt, you're going to be. I'm just letting you know. And if you haven't been hurt by anyone here at Arise, you're going to be. At some point, you're going to be hurt. It's just, it's just reality. It's not that we're bad and evil and wicked. We're just weak humans who sometimes don't get it right. Amen? And so it's going to happen. It's not a good enough excuse to pull yourself away because you don't do that in other areas of society where you've been hurt. Somebody else will say, I'm too busy. We talk about this all the time. We bang on about this all the time. We are not too busy today because every bit of technology we have is making our life and everything we do so much quicker than it used to be 50, 100 years ago. We've never been able to do things faster than we do now, yet we say we're too busy. You're not too busy. All the time you're saving, you're getting distracted by a whole bunch of other non-important things. We're not too busy. We're too distracted. My grandparents had probably four things in their life. Not that my grandparents... Well, they did. Actually, my nana, my grandma went to church, great-great-grandma years ago. And that generation had probably four things in their life. They loved their family. They went to work. They might have went to the pub on a Saturday, had a beer with their mates, and they went to church on Sunday. And that was about all their life consisted of, four to five things. If we sit back and look at our life now, we've got 30, 40, 50 things we're trying to devote our life to and our time to. And unfortunately, it usually ends up being in the Jesus side of life that gets pushed to the side. We're not too busy, we're just too distracted. And if you are genuinely too busy in this place to, to make time for fellowship, then I'm going to suggest to you, you literally are too busy. You literally are too busy. Go back and make some life changes. Because you need to be with other believers. We need this thing called fellowship. Another person will say, I don't believe in organised religion. Okay, great. We're going to start 10 o'clock next Sunday. I hope you're here. We may not be here. I don't know we're too organised, but we might be here, but, but we might not. Let's just, I don't know. What is that? I don't like organised religion, you know? But you want your bank to be organised. You want your boss to be organised and your pay goes in at the right time, right? You're not going to be happy if your boss, oh, I'll just pay you in a couple of weeks. It's all good. What? What? You want the school to be organised. You want class to start at the right time. And you, you don't want to be sitting there in the car and the school goes, oh, no, we're going we're gonna to keep the kids here till 4.30 today. Just sit in the car park. She'll be right. What? I've got plans. I've got her. We want everything else in life to be organised and we're happy for everything else in life to be organised. But I don't like organised religion. What does that even mean? I don't like organised religion. Again, I'm not quite sure I understand that one. Jesus looked pretty organised to me. The early church looks pretty organised to me. At the hour of prayer, they turned up. What does that mean? They had an organised hour of prayer. I mean, what does disorganised religion mean? Come on. We, we, we judge the church in so many ways that when we step back and look practically at the world, we don't judge the world that way. But we have such a harsher judgment on the church, probably because deep down inside we haven't devoted ourselves to fellowship and some of us are looking for a way out. And the challenge this morning is, have you devoted yourself to fellowship? And the last one I want to throw at you. Fellowship is not just about a Sunday gathering. And here's the thing. You are 100% correct. I will high-five you and amen you all the way. But it has always, always included it. It's always included. Always, always included the body getting together for the word of God and prayer and worship. It's always been a part of what the church has done for 2,000 years. Now we're so sophisticated, we feel like we don't need all that stuff. It's archaic, it's ancient, and we wonder where is the power of God? I don't think God has changed. So I'm looking in here going, okay, Lord, you haven't moved away from me. I still think you want to release healing. I still think you want to deliver people. I still think you want to save people. I still think you want to pour your spirit out upon all flesh. I still believe that with all my heart. So God, what adjustments do I need to make? How do I realign myself with you? Because a lot of us are sitting back praying, God, would you realign yourself with us? And God's going, it's not how it works. I'm the Lord. You're not. <laughs> you know, I'm the Lord. The writer of Hebrews had their own thoughts as to why people don't devote themselves to fellowship. And I think the writer of Hebrews gets it right. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through to 25. We've got that there. 24 and 25. 
And this is the verse that gets used a lot to manipulate you to come to church. Right? I'm not using it to manipulate you to come to church. I want you to see something now. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. But exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Here's the reality. Most people stop attending fellowship because they stop considering other people. And all they do is consider themselves. Let us consider one another. If you're considering more than just yourself, and you're considering the broader body of Christ, and you're considering the other people, and you're considering what can I bring, I'm not just there to, to, to take, 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 take. What do I give? I'm an important part of the body. And as much as I'm getting, I've got stuff to give as well. And if we are the kinds of people that just simply consider ourselves, then yeah, you'll find easy reasons why fellowship is not that important. Hanging out with the community of believers is not that important. But I would challenge you. It's because you've stopped considering one another. And we need to consider one another. And we need to stir one another on. How many of you, before you came this morning, did you pray for our gathering? I wonder how many people naturally Sunday morning you pray, Lord, I'm going to go and I'm going to meet with your people, Lord. It's going to be awesome. And God, I've got something to give. There's going to be somebody there that might be hurting or, or, or God, is there a word that you have for me that I can go up to somebody over coffee and say, you know what, I was praying for you this morning, Clint. I felt like the Lord said. I love that story of, 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 of uh, was it, uh, who is it? Is it Peter and John? Who is it in prison? Remember? They're chained down there in prison. They've got the chains on and so on, and then they end up worshipping God at midnight. It says their chains fell off, Silas. Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas. And their chains fall off. But what's interesting, it wasn't just their chains. Other people's doors opened up. Just, God, when I get there this morning, I'm going to worship. Let me worship with all my heart. Because I don't know what the person to the left and the right of me is feeling, but I want my worship to unlock something in their life as well, God. So I'm just going to give myself to you and I'm going to worship you. It's not all about me. I bring something as well. And when we stop thinking of others, and by the way, there's nothing new because 2,000 years ago they were encouraging people, don't forsake the gathering together. It's not new. You're not a trendsetter if you do it. <laughs> 2,000 years people have been saying, don't do it. Don't isolate yourself. Don't pull yourself away from the word of God. It's imperative to not forsaking gathering in order to achieve the exhorting one another stuff. So the reason people don't devote themselves to fellowship is because they've stopped considering one another. And they're only considering themselves. Let me encourage you. Let me challenge you this morning. Have you devoted yourself to fellowship? Whether it be here, whether it be the place that you normally go to, have you devoted yourself to that fellowship? Because the early church, it's one of the pillars of the, of the church. From that point on in Acts, we see this amazing activity of God in his people and through his people. And, and those pillars right there at the start was first devoted heart to God. And when their heart was devoted to God, the overflow of that, the natural outcome of a heart devoted to God was a devotion to his word, to prayer, to fellowship and to communion, the breaking of bread. There was a natural flow on from that. Have you devoted yourself have you devoted yourself to fellowship? Have you devoted yourself? Or are you more addicted? I'm just waiting for the feeling. When I have the feeling, I'll rush after it. Then the feeling's not there. If we want to see God do what God wants to do, we need to be devoted to the things that God's people have always been devoted to. Amen? Fellowship is something you devote yourself to. Are we devoted? Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for your presence with us. God, I thank you for your word. Uh, Father, I just pray for each person here this morning, Lord. God, I pray that we would feel, the, feel your heart for your people in this thing called fellowship, Lord. That, Father, there is, we weren't just born again to you. We didn't just come into relationship with you, but we were placed into a family, a community. And, God, we don't want to see that community and that family fragmented. We don't want to stand on the outside of that looking in, judging, criticizing. God, we don't want to be people that contribute to the isolation that happens in the body of Christ. Father, we want to experience fellowship as the early church experienced it. So Lord, I pray, speak to us, encourage us, challenge us where we need to be challenged. The Lord, we would step into a place where we make the decision that we are going to devote ourselves to fellowship. We are devoting ourselves, not just to you, but we're devoting ourselves to your body, your community, to your church. And we ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen.